Hi everyone, I'm Eugene, I use he and pronouns. Hi, I'm Thomas, I use he and they pronouns. And today we're doing strike syllabus week six, unions, 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 past, present, and future organizing. So I, we'll start off today just giving you some like basic definitions, go into some history, talk about some cases. It's gonna be super fun. So what is a union? A union is uh, from Merriam-Webster, you know, the key definition place, is an organization of workers formed for the purpose of advancing its members' interests in respect to wages, benefits, and working conditions. Karl Marx in Capital Volume 1 also talks about unions. It's a very kind of like basic overview of them. The value of labor power constitutes the conscious and explicit foundation of the trade unions, whose importance for the working class can scarcely be overestimated. The trade unions aim at nothing less than to prevent the reduction of wages below the level that is traditionally maintained in the various branches of industry. That is to say, they wish to prevent the price of labor power from falling be, uh, below its value. And Marx is really um, thinking here about the way that like, extractive labor um, is a like constant push between the search for higher profits and lower wages on behalf of like um, corporations and for working people to try to um, get decent wages, less hours for work, things like that. So this is really the why Marx is talking here is about class struggle and the kind of the bare bones of that. So in very like logistical terms, a union is a legal unit um, that consists of a bargaining unit that can act as a representative for a union of employees in all matters of the law in regards to a collective agreement. Um, it's typically through a formal organization that includes things like a head office, a legal team, and it is funded through the regular union fees or dues collected by its members. This collective bargaining is a is specifically increased bargaining power wielded by the workers. Um, and part of this is that there is an elected leadership that bargains with the employer on behalf of union members. And union members are called the rank and file. Um, and it negotiates labor contracts, which is known as collective bargaining. So there are various types of unions and the types of unions are really around why they're organizing. So probably one of the most historically popular types of union organizing is uh, what's called craft unionism, which is a particular section of skilled workers. Things like um, in building trades, all the carpenters belong to the carpenters union, the plasterers join the plasterers union, the painters are part of the painters union. They're, it's like trade specific. Uh, general unionism is a cross-section of workers from various trades. And then there's industrial unionism, which is all workers within a particular industry um, are part of that union. So this would be like cross-cutting an industry and embracing the entire working class. So perhaps something like a uh, transportation union would be thinking of all of the workers across any of the fields related to transportation. And an, another form of union is enterprise unionism, where a particular plant or company joins and forms a union for that particular plant or company. This is very popular in Japan. Um, and the way that unions work is that they are divided into locals with national or international federations. So here at UC, in the UC system, we are represented by UAW 2865. So what that means is that the United Automobile, Aerospace, and Agricultural Implement Workers of America, that's the international union, has a local 2865. And that local is for the 10 campus systems across the University System of California that covers TAs, tutors, and readers. Some background knowledge for UAW is founded in 1935. Uh, it has more than 400,000 active members and more than 580,000 retired members in the US, Canada, and Puerto Rico. So then it's international. Uh, there are more than 600 local units, and currently, uh, and this is all information from their website, it has more than 1,150 contracts with some 1,600 employers. Now, this slide is from 
uh, an excellent slideshow called Academic Labor Movement Revitalization and Regression by Dwayne Wright in 2020 that really is talking about the UAW in the UC system, giving a, an excellent historical overview. Um, and I like I'm I know people in the COLA movement have given this presentation before and would love to see it on Strike University, but it hasn't been done yet. Um, and we're not going to go that far. We're giving more of a general overview. But I liked what this showed is two styles of how to make and maintain a union. So we have business unionism, which is top-down decision making. Um, it is thinking about the transactional relationship. Members are the source of its dues. It collaborates with management. It's generally reactive. Um, it's closely tied to the Democratic Party. So thinking about it like entrenched bureaucracy of a union. Whereas social movement unionism is bottom-up decision-making. We talk about horizontal decision-making in these kind of settings. Um, it's an empowering relationship. The members are the union, so it's not necessarily developing that hierarchy, that bureaucracy. Um, it is proactive. It's often active antagonism and opposition to the management of the, their employer. And it's run by the members, politically independent and or the radical parts of the union. Um, and the really the, the characteristic that differentiates these two is how institutionally oriented these are. Um, are they within them are they within the, the the employment structure? Are they developing a bureaucracy? And that really is what's going to divide these two separate styles. And as Thomas and I get into some of these cases that we're talking about, it's really good to reflect on well what is the what union style do we have here? Also, before we get into this too far, um, note that we're not trying to just give you like a perfect picture. Unions are like the best thing in the world. There's no problems with them. Join a union or die. It's nothing like that. Um, we want to present kind of some history of it and that they're um, like anything become uh, the, the history of union organizing has uh, good things and bad things. Um, what we do want to say is that like with any organization, um, the bureaucratization of a union with trenchant institutional power sometimes begins to mirror the imagery, the institutions that unions try to bargain with. Um, and in fact, creates another hierarchical structure of power that is used then to privilege some and disadvantage others. So unions, like lots of different kind of um, successful labor organizations, tend to become bureaucratic and which can actually mean they're not advocating for their union members any longer. Um, so let's go into like a brief history of unions in the US. Uh, one of the first successful unions was the Federal Society of Journeymen, Cordwainers in Philadelphia in 1794. Fun fact, Cordwainers are shoemakers. Uh, and this is really seen as the beginning of a sustained union organizing for American workers. In Philadelphia as well, in 1827, we have the Mechanics Union, a free trade association. Then in 1866, we have the National Labor Union. A very important one is the Knights of Labor, which was formed in 1869 by Uriah Smith-Stevens. Now, last week we talked about May Day history. And one thing we talked about was the Haymarket Affair. And the Knights of Labor were closely tied with the, everything that happened with the Haymarket Affair. So um, after, after that event, um, the American Federation of Labor um, was formed in 1886 by Samuel Gompers. Uh, a racist. <laughs> what'd you say? A racist. We'll talk about it later. I don't want to fight. <laughs> um, and so because of all of the events of the Haymarket Affair, um, the American Federation of Labor was formed, and this becomes a very long-lasting, very powerful union in the United States. Uh, in 1905, the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, um, are formed, and they are seen as the radical, um, the radical union. They're called the Wobblies, uh, and the philosophy and tactics are described as revolutionary industrial unionism with ties to socialist and anarchist labor movements. Unions themselves have have ties to socialist movements, right? The idea of a collective bargaining tool, a collective um, workers union. Um, but the idea of a DW promotes the idea of one big union, that all workers should be united as a social class to supplement 
capitalism and wage labor with industrial democracy. Um, so they had uh, their peak of the IWW in 1917, um, but it had huge turnover with people being part of it for just a few months. Then in 1935, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO, splits from the AFL um, in 1938 because of the, re the AFL's rejection of industrial unionism versus craft unionism. So really there was this, um, through the 20s and 30s, a big discussion of how unions should be organized. Is it industrial or is it craft? Um, and then they joined together in 1955 to develop, to develop the, the AFL-CIO, which continues to this day. The first case we're gonna present um, as maybe our bigger, is, is uh, something near and dear to my heart. Um, we're talking about Butte, Montana, which is where I grew up and where I'm from. Um, this town is a mining camp turned into a mining town that had immigrants from all over the world. Um, huge Irish population, also Finnish, Chinese, Italian, amongst others, um, who created ethnic neighborhoods and would like um, develop neighborhood coalitions and like protect like vigilante protection for their like ethnic neighborhoods. Um, the Chinese, uh, in particular. Um, followed the um, what happened with a lot of Chinese immigrants. Um, the migration stopped in 1882 with the passion of the Chinese Exclusion Act. There's anti-Chinese sentiment through the 1870s onwards. Um, so very, very similar story of what happened with Chinese throughout the rest of the U.S., which I think Thomas will get into a, a bit. Um, but again, Butte has a huge Irish population, which was really strong in supporting unions. Um, silver mining was was really what got Butte to be a big mining town. And then when they found copper mining, a copper ore there, was really the cat the catalyst for making this what was it was called the richest hill on earth. Um, through its history, Butte's mining and smelting operations generated an excess of forty eight billion dollars worth of ore. So in nineteen ten, um, mined copper ore totaled. 284 million pounds, silver ore total 10 million ounces, and had over 37,000 ounces of gold, which seems like a lot. I think you can make a lot of jewelry with all of that. Um, Butte was the biggest copper producer in North America, rivaled only by South Africa and worldwide metal production. And in World War I, the price for copper, um, these are just some, some numbers, it got up to 27.2 cents uh, per ounce of copper or per pound of copper, um, where the production costs were about 10 cents per pound. So it was really huge profits to be made by copper mining. Here's some fun pictures. On the left uh, is during a Miners Union Day parade, the bunch of people out for that parade. On the right is just a picture of uh, the, the Uptown Butte, uh, what it looked like. Yeah, old tiny pictures, how fun. Uh, it was also known as the Gibraltar of Unionism. So the Butte Miners Union formed in 1881, the BMU. And um, this was really in between when silver mining became really popular and before copper mining really took off. So the union was established before the huge mining operations got started, which was part of the reason why the union became so effective. Um, because unions became so strong in Montana, um, it, the Butte Miners Union helped to form the Western Federation of Miners in 1893. And BMU was named the uh, local number one through that union. Uh, at this time, Butte was the largest union in America. In 1896, BMU had 4,000 people in its membership and which, well, at which point the union could provide social services to its members. And by 1900, you had 34 different unions representing 18,000 members through various trades. Um, Butte was known as a closed shop town so that non-union miners had to join the union before they could work. And this becomes really important for, um, for the working in mines and what happened afterward. Here we can see the local number one, part of their parade. And on the right is uh, a, another picture of Uptown Butte. These were the like mining operations, um, the very distinctive style of those trestles. What filter is that on those photos? It's so neat. It's a sepia, I think. 
Mm, I love uh, it. Is it Meadowlark? I think, yeah, you should try it. <laughs> Maybe I will. So, be huge, strong union town was advocating for um, good wages. It was known as uh, like one of the highest wages you could get in the United States and had immig immigration coming to it from all corners of the globe, really, because of the what was afforded. Um, 1883 to 1906 is known as the War of the Copper Kings. We have Marcus Daly, uh, William Andrews Clark, F. Augustus Heinze, and the Amalgamated Copper Company all fighting to have control over these copper mines. And that's, you could really get into the Copper Kings and all the like nonsense that they did. Um, but the big thing to note is that 1906, the Amalgamated Copper Company, which at a later date became the Anaconda Copper Mining Company, acquired the holding of Heinze and really ended the, cop the War of the Copper Kings. <clears throat> um, the Butte scale of miners' work was three, $3.50 a day of work, and there was no raise between 1878 and 1907. In 1908, the union negotiated to get a sliding scale, um, where it was still $3.50 a day, but depending on how um, the price of copper for that day, you would get more or less money. Things came to a head in 1914, um, where there was two clear factions, um, the conservatives and the radicals. Um, one group, uh, the conservatives, as they were known, favored sticking close to the Western Federation of Miners, whereas the radicals um, were really more aligned with the IWW, the Wobblies. Um, and on June 13th, Miners Union Day, um, the day before, 1,200 miners walked off the job because they were, they were card wrestling or checking to make sure everyone had paid their dues. And the radicals didn't think that the union was doing enough to protect their rights and to, do, um, and to actually be a good union for them. So on the day of the Miners Union Day, um, they, uh, these radical miners attacked the parade and ransacked the BMU Union Hall. Um, the next day, or the aftermath of that, um, was like riots apparently all over the city. Uh, in, on June 23rd, there was a meeting called that was only conservatives allowed to go there. Um, and so a large crowd gathered outside, there was a shooting, which caused some of the miners to go to the mines, get some explosives, and dynamite the Union Hall, um, which was, yeah, very exciting, very wild. Um, after this, martial law was, de was declared on Butte by the governor, and for two months they had, uh, they had <laughs> national guards there uh, to make sure that everything was safe. Um, because of this, incident, it allowed the uh, Amalgamated Copper Company to declare Butte an open shop town. What this meant is that you could work at any mine without being a union member. And in fact, they did not recognize any unions um, until, uh, oh gosh, until the 20s. Um, oh, until after 1934, it is right there. <laughs> Um, the IWW is blamed for these disturbances, um, and, act, and the unions do not get the collective bargaining they had. It was really that short period of time where you, it was a union town and super strong. A lot of things happen later. In 1917, we have, um, there is a, the, um, the speculator, the Grand Mountain and Speculator Mine disaster, which is the worst hard rock mining accident in U.S. history. There's the um, the murder of Frank Little, IWW strikes in the eight, uh, 1918 and 20. Um, but what is interesting here is the direct correlation between the growth of corporate power and the decline of labor influence. So as soon as the amalgamated uh, mining company was able to secure a stronghold, a monopoly in the, mine, in the mines in Butte, was able to really undercut union power and eventually opening it up to be an open shop town. Um, There's also an internal rift that the union kind of tore at itself um, because it was more aligned with this bureaucratizing, really kind of embedding itself in the company and didn't seem to be doing enough for the rank and file members. And this kind of is a chart that shows that growth. So after this moment, um, and we'll get into a bit, a bunch of legislation gets passed 
so that at the, in the 1950s, we have the highest percentage of union density in the United States, and which then drops off. And you see, uh, then this is private organizing. You can see also that we have public unionizing, which is and remains pretty high um, in the 80s uh, and through to now. Some of these things that strengthen unions um, started from in the 1920 to 1929, where it was generally prosperous. So a strong economy made, a, made for a weak union leadership. And there were a lot of anti-union sentiments in employers and the government. The Great Depression created mass unemployment and unrest, which really gave a lot of strength to, um, to unionizing. And a couple pieces of legislation were really important. The Norris LaGuardia Anti-Injunction Act of 1932 um, offered procedural and substantive protections against the easy issuance of court injunctions during labor disputes. So this meant that, um, that they could limit union behavior in the 1920s and they could, had to stop. The other one was the Wagner Act which guarantees the right of private sector employees to organize into trade unions, engage in collective bargaining, and take collective action, such as strikes. And this continues to today. You are allowed, um, as part of your employment, to organize for a union legally um, and to strike legally. Um, in World War II, um, because of, you know, World War II, it expanded membership to 14.3 um, uh, million members in 1945 which included 36% of the US workforce, um, which also up to this point was really male dominated, focused on women factory workers as well. And then kind of the end of this, uh, of this period of union strength became the Labor Management Relations Act of 1947, the Taft-Hartley Act, Hartley Act, which also remains in effect today. It prohibits unions from ju jurisdictional strikes, wildcat strikes, solidarity or political strikes, or closed shop areas. Uh, it also stopped monetary donations by unions to federal political campaigns. It also became the impetus for allowing states to pass right to work laws to uh, ban union shops. And at this moment, they could fire communists. So um, in the turn of the century, part of what was an issue in Butte was that people could be fired for being socialists. And actually, there was an incident where a bunch of Finnish miners were fired for, be, for, for being Finns or for being socialists, and the union did nothing to stop it. Um, so here we have the Red Scare, which is also part of the Lavender Scare, where people were fired for being gay. Um, any excuse to fire someone, especially if they're pro-union, was codified into law. That part has been um, taken out, but the Taft-Hartley Act remains on the books today. The last bit for me, <laughs> I realize I've been talking for a while, um, is this is a, I think a good, it's not my chart, it is a chart I found that shows union membership and income inequality. So you can see um, on here a couple of points, the Wall Street crash, where the blue line is the top 1% income share, and the red is union members, and it is, to it, it does that thing where they're totally relational. <laughs> Whereas union membership goes up, the wealth disparity, income inequality goes down. Um, and you can see where they cross each other twice. Um, so I think it's important to note that unions give, um, and we'll talk about that. I'll go to that in a second. Thomas, you're up. Thanks for listening to me. You're muted, sweet cheeks. I was oppressed it too many times. Um Thank you for all that information and case studies in the chart um, that you do. It's not yours, but <laughs> you enjoy it. But it's sure pretty. Uh, hmm? It's sure pretty. It is. It's good. And I don't, I don't care you didn't cite it correctly. I think it is yours now. Um, but anyways, I'm going to take on a hard left tone-wise and subject matter-wise into labor unions and racism in the U.S. And just for content note, that some of what we're going to talk about has some description of racist violence and rhetoric, um, but nothing super graphic, um, but just be aware. So uh, the U.S. in the U.S., uh, history of racism has uh, inflected many parts of union and labor organizing history, which is not surprising given 
the history of this country. Um, and just as some examples, in July, July 13th, 1863, some white laborers attacked free black citizens um, who were exempt from the draft. This was in the middle of the Civil War, and there was this rhetoric coming out of a lot of Confederate politicians that because free black men could not be drafted, they were gonna take the jobs of white men who were drafted into the war. Um, and so these fears yeah, were propagated by Confederacy politicians and 11 black men were lynched in these attacks um, and an orphanage for black children was burned down. All the children had been evacuated before it burned down, but it was a very violent um, kind of or racist violence that emerged out of kind of labor concerns. And at the time, President Lincoln had something to say about it. He's always spouting off, but he said, beware of prejudice, working division, and hostility among working people. The most notable feature of a disturbance in your city last summer was the hanging of some working people by other working people. It should never be so. The strongest bond of human sympathy outside the family relation should be one uniting all working people. So Lincoln had a vision of a united workforce that didn't kind of follow along um, lines of racism or other kinds of divisions. And that's something he called for, but that's not how a lot of early labor history played out. Um, so I guess for example, or primarily I'm gonna be talking about anti-black racism in union organizing, but there's also, as Eugene kind of indicated earlier, um, anti-Asian sentiment and some anti-immigrant sentiment in some moments. So for instance, in 1901, um, the Resolutions Committee for the AFL denounced the Chinese as, quote, people of vice and sexual immorality who were, quote, in, of inferior social standards. Um, Samuel Gompers, Sammy Gomps, president of the AFL, also had a lot to say about anti-Asian racism, uh, or <laughs> that was racist against Asians, he didn't say about it. Um, but he claimed that the Chinese, quote, as a race are cruel and treacherous. Um, and he later expressed the belief that the nation's success the success of the nation, the United States, quote, depended upon maintenance of racial purity, um, which for him specifically was like an immigrant thing. He was like kind of okay with uh, black people working and being unionized. Um, sort of a tidbit in that context, he strongly supported Mayor E.Z. Schmitz of San Francisco, quote, a labor candidate and who was elected on a labor platform who began segregating. Oh, he was in favor of segregating Japanese school, school children. Um, the quote I picked, I didn't modify, but he was a Japanese segregationist um, politician who Gompers supported. And so a lot of this, these examples are specifically anti-Asian, but a lot of this stemmed from broader intolerance and anxieties about immigration. So a lot of unions took action against Eastern Europeans and other non, sort of like non, Russians, um, like non, whatever, American people, but Asians took out a big brunt of it in this period. Um, the racism within unions persisted as unions across the country began to proliferate and increase in number and in power. Uh, Booker T. Washington wrote a piece about this called The Negro, the Negro and the Labor Union, it was published in 1913. Um, and I'm not, I don't have any quotes from it specifically, but he talks about a lot of the reasons that black people were hesitant or not incorporated into unions. And he frames it as a, uh, kind of a feature of like kind of black consciousness that has been informed by racist policies of unions. So he mentions that many unions forbade black workers from joining at that time. Um, and even some unions that were all white only unions tried to forcibly remove black workers or stop black workers from working in that trade, even if they weren't doing it through the union, they would, um, there were pickets, there was like a, the railways was like a big, hot spot all your racist unions. Um, and there were all white unions who protested um, the fact that they would hire, uh, that, that the company they were working for hired black employees as well. Um, some unions that did permit black workers into their ranks sometimes denied them, still denied people admittance on the basis of race. So even though it wasn't official policy, even though officially they allowed black people to work in the unions, um, they would still in practice not always allow them. Sometimes even when they did allow black people into these unions, um, they could restrict the options of black members who are allowed to join. They wouldn't be able to achieve the same kind of ranks of work or they would create kind of arbitrary divisions and new titles for black workers so that they couldn't claim the same kind of income as white people doing the same jobs. Um, this was a probably ordered bullet point list because they also, um, tended to effectively exclude black workers from their trades by um, 
saying that they were allowing black members getting exclusivity contracts and then like not letting black workers actually join. So it put a lot of people out of work. Um, and these discriminatory practices were justified with the notion of voluntary association. So you can say that it is not a right, it's a privilege and not a right um, to be a member of a voluntary association of people. So they would use, they would try to use the law um, to defend their practices. These measures had tangible effects on the employment of black laborers, both within and outside of unions, as I sort of indicated already. Um, I have a couple of quotes in the notes for these slides that talk about the way that black participation in certain trades decreased substantially at once they became unionized because unions would exclude black people from joining um so but really there were sectors of work that had been predominated by black laborers that slowly were replaced by white laborers once unions became involved which booker key what she talks about so these institutional and informal modes of exclusion made black laborers more willing to break union strikes. They were often called into break strikes and cross picket lines, um, which Booker T. Washington also talks about um, because they said they felt no, obviously, sort of union or no um, affinity for these institutions that had excluded them and they needed the work anyways they'd been pushed out of through the unions. So they would be more willing to break strikes. Um, and in turn, black strike breakers became targets for violence from non-black laborers, um, as I kind of indicated in the earlier example. But there was another example of some racist labor-related violence in 1917 in East St. Louis. Um, when the aluminum ore company went on strike, black workers were brought in by management to break the strike. And as like retaliation for that, or is it kind of, uh, there were riots that broke out. No, unlike in the Butte example, riots, broke out among the white workers um, who set fire to black residential to the black residential districts of Eastern St. Louis and quote, destroyed $7 million worth of property. They drove 10,000 colored persons from their homes and ended, and, and um, the event ended in the death of more than 200 black people and eight white people. And this was from a um, account in the 50s that I'll talk about in a minute. And so this kind of seems like it could be just like the overwhelming passion of um, the strike or that it could be kind of spontaneous, but it was very clear that this was an extension of discourse that had already been existing in the union before that. So a few months before the attacks, before um, the black um, strike worker, or the black laborers had been called in to break the strike, the secretary of the um, East St. Louis AFL, Central Trades and Labor Union, called on union members to go to city hall and demand a halt to quote the importation of black workers from the South. But she claimed to had, quote, reached a point where drastic action must be taken to get rid of a certain portion of those who are already here. So there's already this language about sort of removing us for outsiders um, who are black from labor markets. So it was very much fomented and very much the thing, even in pretty immediate retrospect, people realized was the outgrowth of longstanding racial discrimination. Um, Herbert Hill writes about this incident and a lot of other things. He was the NAACP labor secretary for a long time who wrote a lot of pieces about labor unions and racism, um, and specifically one he wrote for a kind of popular publication. It was called Labor and the Negro, the Record of Discrimination, where he, said, he starts by saying, quote, labor's democratic ideals are in serious conflict with, with a tradition of racial discrimination in the unions that is currently very much alive. And he's writing this in 1959. So in the time of desegregation, efforts being implemented, there's still this question of how does desegregation fit into and reckon with the sort of long history of racial division in unions. Um, Herbert Hill notes that unionization in the South often led to designating of certain trades as white man's work, which excluded black laborers from jobs that he previously predominated. I kind of mentioned that earlier, but just kind of something he talks about more in length with some actual numbers in this piece. So these sorts of incidents throughout the late 19th and early 20th century of racism within unions is important to know, but we might have the question of why specifically are we talking about this? Why is it sort of important to the current landscapes of union organizing or how we think about labor? That's because of the div racial divisions that had existed before sort of the growth of labor unions, but which continued throughout it. And, um, and also I should mention this, there were efforts, a lot of resolutions and attempts to prohibit um, racist policies amongst members of the AFL or CIO, but those were shot down by the sort of bigger, um, like the, the big voting board. So there were proposals, there were attempts throughout the 20th century to de, um, de to get rid of discriminatory practices that just failed throughout the 20th century. Um, and so these divisions persisted and eventually kind of 
informed or have some sort of connection to the right to work policies that Eugene mentioned a bit earlier. Um, so this is kind of a basic quote that right to work laws allow workers in a unionized workplace to opt out of paying union dues, thus eroding the union's financial standing and its bargaining power. Um, and these right to work laws were first kind of spearheaded and lobbied for by Vance Muse. He was a conservative from Texas or by our measures are conservative. I don't know how their words worked back then, but he was a um, white supremacist. He worked for um, political lobbies that had like white supremacist and racist views. And um, he was one who just developed right to work. And it was sometimes like framed like a state's rights issue or labor issue, but he was very much fueled in this project by white supremacist views and anxieties about racial mixing in the workplace. He thought that unions admitting um, both black and white members was going to make forced racial sort of mixing, which he found very objectionable. He had some really like disgusting quotes about it. Um, but so that these divisions, which not that the unions um, getting rid of these policies they had would have stopped right to work people from doing this, but there's a lot of overlap with the way that Muse thought about race and um, segregation in the workplace as to how unions have thought about it as well. And so this process of sort of identifying divisions within unions and using them to undermine the welfare of all unions is something that's continued throughout the later half of the 20th and into the 21st century. This took a kind of different valence for Ronald Reagan. He sort of pitted public and private sector workers against each other, saying that um, not, not every sector of work should be unionized, and that's been something that's been with us today still. Um, and even Trump and um, like Scott Walker um, appeal to specific unions as a way to sort of get them to break away from the group. So Trump will meet with actually a lot of um, construction unions, partly because he wants them to build walls, um, but he meets with those unions who tout him as someone who's pro-labor when he is actively undermining the union activities of other sectors. And also construction and railroad unions had like the most consistently discriminatory policies in the first half of the 20th century. So like, it just seemed like kind of very like bitter and ironic that they are now like very touted by Trump and invested in like these like, wall building things. So just some ways of bringing this all um, to the current moment, which I'm sure makes so much sense. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Uh, one thing about, yeah, right to work laws, um, the name is very, sounds great, right? Like you, you have the right to work, but it really is about um, eroding any kind of collective bargaining that you can have and the power that comes from collective laboring, um, as Thomas is talking about. So, also, I had a joke I took out, but it was that uh, it was right to work, more like a white to work, because this white supremacist <laughs> was one who passed it. So, I had to keep that. I can't believe you took that out. That's so good. White to work. Those I was afraid it wasn't clear enough with like the text on the screen. So, I was like, I'll just not do well, it. Anyway. Well, we'll put it in. We'll put this in. Um, ben, put this in here. I don't know. We don't. That's not happening. <laughs> All right. So, with that host, historical background from uh, both me and Thomas, right? Like, well, what have unions got us? And here's a pretty exhaustive list of like some sp very specific things that unions have, have gotten us as workers, especially in the United States. Things like weekends, breaks, an eight hour workday, overtime um, uh, pay, holiday pay, sexual harassment laws, wrongful termination laws, your 40 hour work week, the right to work, um, or no, the right, the right to strike, that's what I meant to say. Um, and in fact, some, some basically all of the benefits that you have at work, whether you work in public or private, um, all the benefits you enjoy every day are there because unions fought hard and long for them against big business. Um, who did everything they could to prevent giving you your rights. And there's a quote from, yep, Thomas? How hard and how long? <laughs> Those are the questions. With their <laughs> lives sometimes. Um, so there's a quote from some Butte miners that were asking for a 10 hour workday as like the maximum. And the reason that they're asking for a 10 hour workday is that they could live for 20 years longer. They could actually, they could work for 20 more years if they didn't have to work uh, 12, 14 hour days, which is just wild, right? Like if we think about our work, it's tied to our lives. These workplace protections are for workers against the like big companies and corporations using our bodies for labor for profit. Um, and in fact, the existence of unions raise wages of both unionized and non-unionized workers um, because of what unions do and how they, how they are collectively bargaining kind of raises awareness to a general population for how much money people should make for the non-tangibles, the like extras that, that come with our labor. 
So some global considerations, we're talking a lot about the US and um, we don't have, we've already gone for a long time. We don't have time to get into everything within the globe. But um, when we think about the global South, the, in, the, in our current contemporary moment, the global South workforce is often mobile and made up of lots of transnational immigrants. There's also considerations to think about with the informal sectors of the economies. So things like home-based workers and street vendors, which are difficult to unionize and become collective. They're so individualized and kind of removed from formalized economies, economic structures. Um, global and transnational unions are working to organize labor, assist workers and connecting them with organizers in the global north. So like the internet, that thing is useful for helping um, with boycotts of like Nike to protest the um, situations in um, like sweatshops in around the world with their shoes and things like that. Um, but there continue to be challenges from the neoliberal global capitalism. They can move factories, undercut wages. When you have a globalized world, you have the ability to go into different areas to get the lowest wages possible um, when your kind of cost for materials remains the same. Ness from a book in 2016, uh, Southern Insurgency, argues that the shift of the working class um, power to the global south, so with federal direct investment, with enormous industrial cities and with a transnational workforce has created the biggest working class in the history of the earth, even bigger than what Marx could have imagined when he was thinking about working class consciousness and class warfare. And this is where militant labor organizing can labor the, liberate the world. Ness believes that these values of the IWW, of direct action, of like radical working class are happening in the world right now in the global south specifically. And this could be the way to get us out of the trenches of global capitalism and really create a, like a worker's utopia in the world today. Maybe you do too. Read the book, see what happens, I don't know. So today, it is illegal for employers to fire people who work to organize unions, right? When we, um, the Warner Act guarantees that right. However, that uh, this happens every day. This graph shows from 83 to 2015 how private sector union members have decreased while public sector union members have increased to the point where they're kind of equal. Mother Jones article relates that employers hire anti-union consultants to try to interfere in union elections and undermine the power of unions. Um, this is called union busting. So it's a practice that is undertaken by an employer or their agents to prevent employers, employees from joining a labor union or to disempower, subvert, or destroy unions that already exist. So Martin J. Levitt in a book called Confessions of a Union Buster talks about that um, a campaign against a union is an assault on individuals and a war on truth. The only way to bust a union is to lie, distort, manipulate, threaten, and always, always attack. So it's a, it is a war of information against what union can offer and what they can do. So just, off the like top of my head, three companies that come to mind that are very like publicly anti-union are Walmart, Amazon, and McDonald's. Very, very much known for even even there's like a hint of union organizing will fire people. Um, yes. Last month in New York, Amazon fired a an employee for organizing, and then they said, "Oh no, it's because he was like me or something." They made up a fake reason. Yeah, yeah. it was because of COVID. He was like in public, so they fired him. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, this this is like long, there's a long history of union busting in the United States and the world over, but like specifically now, it, it like continues to happen. Whole Foods has a heat map to track where their potential union act, uh, organizing happened at their stores right now. Um, yeah, well, I, yeah, Whole Foods, um, Walmart has like bo books of like how to stop people from talking about unions, things like that. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to bust it open, but they're busting unions. Yeah, for sure. And then the thing is, it's like, it's about stopping workers from like collectively organizing. I mean, if, if we think about like the individualization of like money and our, our wages, right? Like we don't talk about how much money we make. We don't have an open door policy about like what everyone is getting um, because that would cause us to ask questions like, well, why are, am I making more than that person? Why aren't we making more together? And it's to pit workers against each other. And that's a thousand percent what, what union busting is about. 
anyway, <laughs> me and Thomas go off for, day, for days and days. Mm -hmm. um, but we want, the reason we are doing this this week is because last week in, um, if you're watching this in the future, it's last week for us, but who knows? I think, it's, I think it's the eternal last week. It'll always have a <laughs> It's always last week. Um, the, the, the four campuses that were withholding um, winter grades and Santa Cruz, who's also withholding fall grades, all submitted their grades to, um, to their registrars um, as a way of saying, our strike has changed. Um, we no longer see withholding grades as a viable collective option. So our attention in the COLA movement has really gone to a ULP strike. Well, what the heck is this? ULP is an unfair labor practice, not as when a public employer violates state labor laws. Things like intimidation tactics, retaliating against workers, interfering with workers' rights, among other things. A ULP strike is when workers go on strike to protest their employer's labor law violations. A ULP strike has to specifically center the employer's violations. If not, it, it can be considered some other kind of strike, which could be considered illegal. A wildcat strike is a strike is a non-union sanctioned strike and is illegal in the ideas of the law. But a ULP strike, which is centering the employer's violations, is a legal form of a strike. So what does this have to do with coal? UAW 2865, remember the local union of the of UAW that covers UC readers, TAs, um, has called for a strike vote in response to UC's multiple unfair labor practices, including circumventing and refusing to bargain with UAW 2865 over a cost of living adjustment, that's a COLA, firing and barring future employment to TAs at UC Santa Cruz on a wildcat strike. Now, in order for UAW 2865 to authorize this ULP strike, two thirds of all voting members would have to vote yes on a strike authorization vote. So throughout the month of April, they, um, the union was really trying to get people to pledge to a strike, to this ULP strike, um, in order for them to show the UC that, look, if you don't bargain with us, if you don't negotiate, we have 5,000 people ready to strike. Um, and that is kind of the next step for where COLA is right now. We've moved on from grade withholding in light of a global health pandemic and have gone into this like union sanction strike and trying to work within the union structure because the UC system understands this bureaucracy and the union also is can work within that bureaucracy to get us this cost of living adjustment to get us the, the things that we need tangibly um, to benefit our situ living situation. Great. Anything to add, little Thomas? No. Um, hopefully, we can ULP strike soon. The union has so much money to represent us, and so we need to make our voices heard and send a little pledge so that we can all get to getting. Yeah. The other part of this is that, um, and I think reflecting on why we're doing this, is that these issues don't go away, and whether or not the ULP strike happens, whether we get a COLA now or later, we have our contract as, T, as TAs will be up in, in 2022. Um, so there'll be another round of bargaining. And the, the goal is, I think for uh, COLA organizers, is to get inside of the structure of the union that they have a place at the bargaining table. So it doesn't just become a like bureaucratized union doing whatever the, the head union does that is too closely aligned with the UC system, but perhaps get a more radical voice in to implement change that is long lasting and actually will benefit the workers and get them out of um, like extreme rent burden and be able to actually live and work where, we're, where we are students. Now we should have had big pictures of the people, all the cool people who became um, union official people oh yeah yeah we just had a like a um we just had an election and got a bunch of uh cola people on the union board Bing. so yeah maybe we'll add that in that would be cool to see i love a good smiling cola face yeah everyone and their kind of headshots would be great <laughs> so next week we are we've been like zooming out thinking of history and um in a global sense and doing lots of stuff we're headed to the ucs talk about activism and, and everything that's happened to the UC. Fun fact, it'll be exciting. Explosive, 
great. <laughs> uh, we'll probably talk a lot about UCSB because that's where we both go to school, but we're gonna try to talk about everywhere. Even well, more and I think there's some like very like Davisy things that jump out to mind. There's places. Um, so yeah. <laughs> We'll spin far and wide the little wings will take us. Yeah, who knows? Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>